this is Levi Wampler with MMAStrikingCoach.com. Today we are speaking with Jim Arvanitas, the Renaissance man of pancreation and author of several books on pancreation, including The First Mixed Martial Art, Myth to Modern Times. How are you doing today, Jim? Pretty good. Doing yourself? Doing pretty good today. Having a good day. Great. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the martial arts? Well, first of all, I come from an athletic household. My brother is a New Hampshire State Amateur Golf Champion, so wow. that had something to do with it, uh, because he started very, very young. I think when he first could actually hold a baseball bat or a club, he might have been three or four years old, and he started getting involved in golf, and um, around eight years old, um, I got involved with um, combat sports. And I think a lot of that was because of the fact that there was a lot of Greek ethnic pride. Um, and, um, you know, I know I came home one incident. I was uh, pretty pretty well beaten up, and, and my dad really wasn't too proud of that fact, didn't approve of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was, he, he was a, a very Spartan-like individual coming from Greece. So obviously he didn't want that to happen to me again. It was more of a thing of pride. More than anything else, so he enrolled me to learn wrestling at a local YMCA. And some years later, I took up boxing in the Lowell, Massachusetts area, which at the time was really the hub for boxing um, in the United States. And I competed in both throughout the Northeast. So while my brother was was getting involved in golf competitions, I was actually, you know, involved in combat sports at an early age. And I also had my share of street brawls, um, especially around the Boston Lowell areas. You know, when you're young, you think you're invincible, and I really wanted to kind of test out my stuff. And in one scrape, I got kicked pretty good by a Green Beret karate expert mm-hmm. uh, who was home on leave. Um, and luckily, I knew how to fight dirty, so I was able to <laughs> defeat him. But, you know, the kick current, so I wanted to look into kicking and, and martial arts. So I observed. Asian martial arts such as karate and kung fu and taekwondo, and even though I was impressed with the various striking techniques, I wasn't too impressed with the training methodology coming from a, a wrestling and boxing background. So I never really formally studied of them, any of them, but mm-hmm. um, I found they were a little too rigid for my, um, you know, for, for really what my uh, concerns were when it came to defending myself. So. I saw a lot of forms and formality and all that stuff. And I know it was popular at the time, but I still prefer the freestyle fluidity of boxing and wrestling. Mm-hmm. Um, so instead, I opted to uh, study some box francais savat. And that was in the Boston, Massachusetts area. And I learned some precision kicks using the shod foot. And I pretty much preferred this to karate because it was more similar to a boxing system but, of course, it used the feet as the main weapons in addition to boxing techniques. Mm-hmm. Um, so that had, had a lot to do with, with getting into the martial arts and, and really learning as much as I could about the different systems. But in 1968, while I was in college, I befriended a um, exchange student from Thailand named uh, Super Chai Niki Akatkanai, who was nicknamed Super Cat. Uh, because of his lightning speed in Muay Thai. He was a family champion, and we became very close friends. Um, I mean, it just clicked between us. We had this chemistry and the fact that we were both into the combat arts, mm-hmm. um, really the, kind of a niche for both of us. So we trained together constantly, and this is where I was taught low leg kicks and the brutal close-range elbows and clinch knees of the sport. And um, Really, a little while after that, um, I was involved in another street fight, and uh, this, this wrestling guy, uh, who outweighed me by about 50, 60 pounds, uh, you know, kept taking me down every time I tried to, to land a strike. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, another fight I won, but I learned a lot from it, and uh, especially when you're fighting on the pavement, and he's taking you down pretty hard, and you getting your head thumped against the, the ground, you start saying, well, I better improve my, my grappling skills. So I started learning more ground fighting techniques through combat judo again in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And, but, but it's a little bit different than the, the judo you see today because it focused on the waza or 
sound skills. So here's where I was able to add joint locks and, and cranks and chokes to implement my wrestling background. And then a little bit later, um, after I got out of college and um, I was really expanding my arsenal, I shared knowledge with renowned self-defense expert Masada Yub. I uh, was pretty much trained extensively, extensively with uh, blade weapons and handgun designs. Can you tell us how you got the idea to restore the martial art of pancreation? And in 1969, mm-hmm. um, I began to study the roots of martial arts, um, especially of my own culture. And my dad had frequently gone to Greece, and I accompanied him. But, you know, I was all excited about martial arts and hoping I would find something different there. But all they did was karate and other Asian styles. Mm-hmm. And being proud of my heritage, I thought Greece must have had their own indigenous combat sports, you know, especially since they created the Olympics, right? Mm-hmm. So I commenced researching various resources, and I discovered penetration. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, um, I thought this was exactly what I was doing because I just felt I wasn't a singular stylist. Um, or doing what the, the populace was doing, but I was cross-training in multiple combat systems. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was able to merge all these techniques of my previous studies into one cohesive skill, skill set. Mm-hmm. And I found that that's what my Greek ancestors had done thousands of years before. So, right then, I don't know, being driven as I am, my goal was mm-hmm. to rebuild it from the ashes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I used pretty much what anything I could find in artwork and literature as kind of a blueprint. And um, let me make this clear at this point, that I never intended to replicate pancreation 100%. Mm-hmm. You know, how can you do that after an artist has been really defunct for, what, 3,000 years? <laughs> but I really wanted to use the concepts mm-hmm. and make it uh, more suitable to modern times. So um, that was pretty much my goal. And after I made the cover of Black Belt 1973 and I exposed pancreation to mainstream martial arts, uh, this is pretty much where my odyssey of um, getting it accepted um, commenced. Because mm-hmm. in the beginning, I received so much negative criticism, you know, by the traditional karate establishment. Uh, you know, I just, they kind of felt there was some passing oddity and, I think some even saw pancreation and mixing skills together at the time as a threat, you know, to the more popular karate and kung fu. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, my belief that was that one style um, was really not invincible or, or best. I felt that, you know, each had its strong points and weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I searched for the value in each of the styles. Uh, or anything that I might have researched or read about. And I simply blended the best techniques for optimal combat efficiency and functionality. Um, So, you know, again, I believe that learning is an eternal process. And uh, that that pretty much was my um, motivation in evolving the art. And uh, and it's been evolving ever since, you know, because to me, learning is a a continual process. Mm Mm-hmm. That's great. Now, uh, when training, do you think it's better to practice? Because I know you've done boxing, you've done wrestling, you've done all these arts separately. When you practice them, do you feel it's better to practice uh, together, boxing versus wrestling, or should they be practiced separately? Actually, I feel uh, both are necessary in your training. Uh, and in my particular meal pancreation training, we have uh, anomahia, which is the stand up component, and that consists of mostly um, free motion strikes and takedowns uh, from a distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, also clinch fighting, but uh, the action ceases when you hit the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, there's katomahia, which is the ground component. And this starts out in a clinch, and then due to throws, takedowns, trips, or sweeps, it leads into groundwork uh, with mock strikes on the ground. But at the same time, I fully support, you know, the idea that the way you train is the way you fight. Mm-hmm. So mixing it all together is is valuable training for actual contest separation. So, again, you know, 
Uh, some trainers, some coaches may feel differently, um, but I just feel that I, I think in in any setting, uh, you have to consider both the specialization, um, the isolation, as well as putting it all together so that transitions can flow better. Mm-hmm. So um, in my particular teachings, I would say we do 50-50. Hmm. Yeah, so if you have a something that you're not quite good at, maybe your clinch is a little off, you could just isolate doing the clinch work to get it better, but then you also need to train, spend time training, putting that clinch back into everything. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, because, you know, uh, put it this way, uh, you're you're in a situation where you, you feel pretty comfortable when you are in free motion and you're striking and you're moving in from takedowns if you're a wrestler. Mm-hmm. But then all of a sudden you are in the clinch, you're locked up, and you know nothing about the clinch. So you do have to isolate that area where you become uh, knowledgeable and, and, and uh, fairly proficient at that point because it's all about transitions. You know, in today's combat world, uh, we, we've now come to the point where the Greeks realized this over 3,000 years ago, that real fighting isn't just free motion or, or locked up or stand up or on the ground, but it's transitional. It's always changing, mm-hmm. and you have to adapt to these situations. And this is where, you know, you go from the isolation to really develop the area, and then you put it all together to make those flowing transitions. And because, you, you know, face it in combat, or, or when you're inside the cage or the ring or any type of contest arena, uh, the goal is to put it all together and be functional doing so. Mm-hmm. Now, the, uh, could you tell us some of the mistakes you think fighters make when they're preparing for a fight for, or just in their training in general? Well, I think, obviously, having to cut way too close to fight time is one major mistake. You know, mm-hmm. that, that obviously is zap a fighter of his energy before he even enters the contest arena. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maintaining a good weight throughout your training is essential. Um, I do think a lot of fighters um, with direct running in their training regimens for cardio. And if you're going 15 to 25 minutes, uh, you know, in a bout, um, you got to, I, I mean, obviously you got to have great cardio. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can, you can look at all the modern day training methods today, weight training, um, your isolated drills, your sparring, using different equipment, plyometrics, all of these are great. But in my humble opinion, you know, I'm, a, I'm an advocate of running, and I just feel that it's the best for improving one's endurance. And when I talk about running, I just don't mean long, running long distances, although that's very important, but also short explosive sprints like uh, 50 to 100 yards. So I believe uh, a competing fighter should include you know, as we're seeing, um, you know, mixed martial arts or any type of hybrid combat sport competition is rough on the body, and a lot of injuries occur, which forces athletes to drop out of major matchups or not perform at their best. And you got to admit, it's really hard to come back, no matter how great or gifted an athlete you are, mm-hmm. from a serious injury like an, L- uh, an ACL tear or the like. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you got to be careful of overtraining. Um, Another aspect of training is you got to hone your skill set and your conditioning. Um, but you also have to know as much as possible about who you're fighting. So, you know, you got to relate to the opponent. And, you know, in today's technology, you can watch films and tapes of his earliest, or earlier fights, video, or whatever. Um, so you're, you're absolutely prepared. Um, so you have to be careful not to make strategic follow-ups, as I call them, from fight mm-hmm. time, by not sticking to your particular game plan. You know, uh, part of your training should be to study the opponent so you can avoid his strengths and exploit his weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, you always want to fight your fight, not his. And, you know, I see a lot of fighters getting caught up in the moment. They're either too excited or they're overly anxious or too psyched up or pumped. And a lot of times I think that tends to lose um, what was covered over and over in their training camps. So, you know, they have to listen to their trainers and they have to listen to their, their cornermen, their coaches, 
and uh, make sure that they don't really get lost in that moment and, and you know, forget the plan that they should follow. Um, those are pretty much some of the things I see with, with fighters, um, you know, having problems with today. Mm-hmm. They cut, you know, not included in running, um, overtraining, and um, not really knowing the opponent, you know. So all of these things, I think, are essential in a training program leading up to a fight. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good point because, like you say, some people, uh, they do too much and then they end up overtraining. And some people aren't doing enough of the right things, like the cardio and especially sprinting, uh, to get ready for that fight. And then they try to cut weight. But if they'd been doing the cardio the whole time, they may not have had to cut as much weight. Well, that's true. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, you really do have to have a plan. I think that's why you have these, these training camps and good coaches because, mm-hmm. you know, you, you've got to have somebody that's skilled in, in wrestling. You have to have someone that's skilled in boxing. You have to have someone that's skilled in, in jiu-jitsu or uh, BJJ. But you also have to have the conditioning coaches because face it, if you go into a fight as being skilled in technique, but you don't have uh, the conditioning and the cardio, then that's not going to work either. Um, so you do really have to have a balance of each. Oh, yeah. Now, some of the conditioning coaches that we've interviewed uh, for MMA striking coach, they've, uh, that's what they're always talking about. Is you have to have that strong cardio. You have to train for the way that you're going to play with the sprints, and you have to be able to do your techniques when you're already winded because that's what it's going to be like in a fight. Well, exactly. You know, I... I've run all my life ever since. I mean, I used to run uh, cross country when I was in high school and college, and I know the the importance of it when it comes to fighting, mm-hmm. even based on my own competition days. And um, I still uh, log about uh, uh, eight to ten miles of running each day, and I get biking in there. Of cardio training rubs off because I, I really do emphasize it, uh, not only for myself but somebody that that's either wanting to get into competition or is competing. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, the cardio, that's one of the first things that, that goes if you don't keep it up or as you, as you get older. So, uh, you really have to make sure that, uh, um, it, it, it's constantly part of your training program. Mm-hmm. Now, do you have any favorite training materials or resources that you'd like to share with us? Just any books or DVDs, workout equipment you think all fighters should, uh, have or know about? Well, personally, I have an excess of 250 books and DVDs in my personal library. And they range anywhere from technology to Greek history to quality-based. So I really believe that with our technology today, it's important that one really keep up with um, different techniques uh, because we have access to this today. Now, as far as media, um, I'll tell you, nothing replaces an experienced trainer or a coach or a high-level fighter or practitioner. I mean, I think that you got to be in a training camp if you're really going to compete um, professionally or, or seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, trying to learn on your own just through media is, is, I mean, it's a start, but it's not the end all for sure. Uh, but if you were going to use it as supplementary um, uh, training material, I would, I would look to um, any of the stuff Victory Belt puts out. They get some mm-hmm. exceptional books by some MMA champions and some high-profile instructors. Uh, what's good about Victory Belt is they're very thoroughly explained. Um, all the techniques are very, very well presented, and uh, there's some real good colorized photography that complements the text. Um, so, you know, uh, BJ Penn's got some stuff through Victory Belt, and Randy Couture's got some good stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. um, Anderson Silva, all of these guys that have become champions have put out some real good stuff. But I'll tell you something. Uh, they are more or less the demonstrator of the techniques. Uh, the writers behind them that are doing the explaining, um, they're doing a great job at making these guys look good. I mean, these guys are good as athletes, mm-hmm. but, you know, it's a real good writer. Uh, as well as, as somebody that's involved in the, the martial arts and combat sports, to sit down, analyze their movements, and put them on paper. And um, two of some of the Victory Belt um, secondary authors, um, you know, have proven really effective. Guys like um, Krauss, 
Mm-hmm. And um, also is Greg uh, Cordoza. Um, another good writer is um, um, Eddie Bravo. He puts out some good stuff. Yeah. You know, again, I've got this huge library just to keep consistent with everything. And since my mm-hmm. art is so similar to what MMA has become, so uh, mm-hmm. I really like to see what other people are doing. And I, I think that fighters would really uh, uh, gain advantage from that. Oh, also, I want to mention uh, Paladin Press and Black Belt. They put out some good stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, not the, my own stuff, but they, they do sell my products. Can you tell us about some of the books you have through Paladin Press and Black Belt Magazine? Uh, two of my books. I mean, I've got, I think, something like 12 of my videos, two different sets. Mm-hmm. Um, Black Belt has a book a color book uh, that we put out a couple of years ago called The First Mixed Martial Art Pancreation from Myths to Modern Times. Mm-hmm. And, um, um, you know, both are very informative, not only about the history of, of, of pancreation and, and its evolution uh, into neo-pancreation, but also, um, you know, it covers a lot of techniques uh, geared both for the street, which is what Palette and Press specializes in, and also for the competition arena, which which Black Belt um, is more oriented to. Mm-hmm. Now, could you share with us some of the best advice uh, your mentors have ever given you? Well, I'll start with my dad, because um, mm-hmm. I consider him probably my greatest mentor. His, his example taught me to be proud of, of my heritage. Um, and who I am, where you come from. Um, and I think this whole concept of Spartan discipline is from that. You know, I learned from an early age that if you, you really, uh, you really want to get somewhere, you have to be both mentally and physically grounded, um, to get to these extraordinary levels. Um, obviously, you know, um, some of my mentoring taught me to be passionate about anything you do in life since life is so short. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of the reason that I'm so driven um, is because I understand that. Um, and that's why I've, I've not only got this longevity in the martial arts, but I train today like I did, you know, 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is not to be close-minded. Um, my boxing coaches taught me to be open to anything that can make you better in whatever task you undertake. Um, I remember the Susi brothers, uh, who were my boxing instructors, being very influential in, in teaching that um, you want to be the best you can possibly be. Um, and, and they had a lot of uh, good perks about doing those things. Hmm. Uh, now, regarding combat, um, well, a lot of my wrestling and boxing coaches taught me to be confident in yourself, to train hard, but never underestimate any opponent because, you know, you, there's there's always a bad day that you might experience and, and your opponent might be the better man on that day. So um, your plan is to be in the best shape you can possibly be in before competing, but also, you know, um, just because your opponent looks a little overweight or or – you know, he doesn't look as strong or as quick as you. That doesn't mean he can't suddenly submit you or knock you out. Mm-hmm. So just be prepared. Another thing I learned. Uh, also, to stay calm and cool in combat, uh, never to lose your head because you go in there mad or upset or, or too aggressive, then it's going to pretty much sap your energy and um, you could end up losing. Now, I'm not saying losing is bad because losing is a good learning experience. Which is another thing I learned, you know, winning all the time really doesn't teach you, uh, you know, uh, what, what you have to know about your own uh, weak areas. So um, being human, nobody's perfect, and you want to learn and progress from there, go back to the gym and, and, um, and, and progress uh, just in case you do lose. Mm-hmm. And I must mm-hmm. also say that... Um, a lot of my, my own mentoring, uh, e- even though I, I respect a lot of the guys that I have trained with and, and uh, my coaches in the past, um, they get a lot from me. But uh, I think a lot of times uh, 
a lot of your, your discipline comes from within. Um, so if you're self-motivated and self-disciplined and you learn that you have this trait from a very young age, um, you know, you, you can do a lot with that, you know. And it's a trait really that's innate. It's not so much taught sometimes. Mm-hmm. And if you can, you know, uh, kind of like uncover this at an early age, like when you're in your, even before you're 10 years old or in your early teens, I mean, it really can um, help in your self-development through the years. So, you know, that being said, this is why I've trained regularly on a daily basis for many, many years, because this becomes part of your personal routine, like, you know, uh, waking up and going to bed at night. I mean, it's it's pretty much your routine to train, and it's not just training eight weeks in preparation for a fight. I mean, it's every day. And um, especially, I think, as you get older, you're an older fighter. This is uh, particularly important. Mm-hmm. No, that's great. That's a lot of good advice there. Uh, thank you for sharing thank with you. us today. You're absolutely welcome, and um, thanks for having me. This has been Levi Wampler with MMAStrikingCoach.com. Today we were speaking with Jim Arvanitas, the father of modern pancreation. Be sure to check out his books and DVDs through Black Belt Magazine Publishing, Paladin Press Publishing, and you can also find them on BarnesandNoble.com. Thank you for speaking with us today. You're welcome. Thank you.